it's obvious, having said all that, that it's much more easier to construct a world view that is a, uh, a coherent abstraction that assimilates all your abstractions rather than leaving them uh, fragmented, as is most often the case with moderns, where they can have uh, multiple segmented uh, opinions about things, each one contradicting the other, so they don't have to really uh, assimilate them into one harmonious whole. Of course, there are the rare cases where they do uh, make a, an entire worldview, a coherent worldview. And we call those philosophers. Philosophers tend to aspire to do this, to become, to take the, the abstractions that are fragmented inside their brain and to assimilate them into one whole, a unity, uh, an absolute. Uh, philosophers create absolutes. That is, they create one singular worldview which would explain everything about the world. Now, there are two forms of philosophers. Uh, those that are restricted by the world, that is, their senses, which uh, limit how they can assimilate these, world, uh, these abstractions. And there are those, the nihilists, which uh, don't really care. They just, uh, they're just interested in creating a cohesive whole, a harmonious whole which then has to be evaluated by how seductive it is, how the appeals to others, how popular then it becomes. And of course, what is detached from reality is much more appealing to the average uh, mind than what is attached to reality, because reality is threatening to the organism. Uh, an organism needs a, an exclusion of possibilities, like I said. It needs ordering, whereas uh, the world has its own order which may contradict that of the organism or may include chaos that is random uh, dynamics which the mind refuses to accept or is unable to conceptualize so it rejects it this is the most threatening thing about uh, the world it's chaos it's a plausible uh, chaotic nature the mind would rather understand world as something that uh, is rational that is completely governed by by rational laws uh, even if they are uh, contrary to it uh, rather than accepting that there might be certain things about the world which are irrational counterintuitive uh, which uh, no mind can uh, can ever understand which is unknowable uh, that is forever mystical. The only mysticism the modern uh, understands is the mysticism uh, governed by complexity or what is hidden, the yet to be seen, the yet to be discovered, the beyond. You know, this is what Christianity is. This, uh, this is order in the universe and it, and it rests beyond time and space. For the secular humanist, the modern, this beyond this has become more earthly. It's become a, an imminence, again, based on Spinoza. It's become something yet to be. It's coming. Uh, it's a future. So paradise for the Christian is something that rests outside time-space, whereas for the modern version of the same uh, nihilism, it rests as a utopia yet to come. And of course, there are also the the different types of uh, philosophers, thinkers, like uh, I implied earlier. There are those who engage reality, face it, and try to uh, make sense of it, even though it restricts, uh, restricts their, uh, the way they can combine uh, abstractions to form a cohesive model. Uh, and there are those who want to completely detach from the world in order to just fabricate whatever combination they prefer their only criteria being that it's appealing it's uh it's it's internally harmonious that is the model is uh in harmony with itself it uh, makes sense within its own premises you know it, it's its logic is self-referential 
Now these models are the most, uh, these uh, philosophers are the most uh, abundant. They're actually the part of the majority because it's the easiest way to think with no uh, external world restricting how you combine uh, abstractions uh, you can simply be guided by some uh, internal ideal basing it on how uh, the abstraction feels uh, what, what's the pleasure potential in it or how it is harmonious within its own premises that is you don't have to adhere to anything external to yourself you just have to adhere to what you just already decided is uh, an absolute and then come up with ways of harmonizing everything you perceive into that now, this is what I've called the the top-down uh, backwards thinking it's the easiest and uh, form of thinking and this is why it's the most popular it is also the easiest way to construct the most appealing seductive uh, constructs uh, philosophies and it is the ones that are also more popular amongst the masses who have no such ability to think beyond their immediate gratification I've gotten into this uh, form of thinking as a form of uh, sexual signaling by males in the uh, video I made on uh, self handicapping uh, so here in the human context the mind uh, having no big cost to its detachment from reality can fabricate a peacock's tail of such extravagance such self handicapping uh, bird weight that its only appeal is as an impressive uh, display of uh, of the male's virility it has no survival utility outside human pre uh, premises as most of these uh, this thinking has none uh, same way as uh, the peacock's tail it, it the, the peacock's tail I'll just give you a brief synopsis uh, whereas the the feathers of birds were evolved to uh, help the bird survive uh, to give it the uh, efficiency of fight flight the peacock still does the opposite it actually makes the peacock the male unable to to effectively fight fight or fly so it is this is why it's called the self handicapping and with humans in the philosophical arena this happens also so without any cost to your thinking you can fabricate any bullshit you want uh, it could be useless outside of human premises but if it's impressive if it's impressive enough to attract if it's so over the top and in fact this is the difference because in the wild the peacock actually suffers the consequences of this tail that is uh, it uses it actually eventually uh, gets uh, killed by predators whereas with humans who are protected sheltered this is not the case they are protected from their own weakness their own stupidity so the extravagance becomes uh, it snowballs it just increases and increases so that it becomes a competition over who can uh, fabricate the most extraordinary extreme most impressive worldview which also uh, remains uh, self harmonious uh, because uh, it has beauty to it just like the the peacock's tail and yet it's totally useless in any other context outside of human relationship uh, human signaling uh, and signaling is another word for semiotics and another word for semiotics is language and a part of language the very you can equate it to a sperm so what genet what a sperm is to genetics words are to mimetics so language is a form of replicating uh, a meme and the word is its sperm its DNA so without any cost to the word being completely useless outside of human premises it becomes just a matter of how impressive it can be how seductive how appealing and how do you appeal to other human beings by offering them pleasure uh, especially when they have no other concerns their their survival is pretty much guaranteed they have certain rights within the system they are 
they will be fed, well, no matter how stupid they are, uh, or if they're crippled or if they're weak, they will pr be protected by an institution, the police force. No matter how poor their judgment is, there will always be somebody, something to step in and protect them. Because this is the fact, they become bored. So their only way to to get rid of this excess energy which accumulates is through uh, sexuality, uh, the libidinal release of excess energy, which is also happens through the nervous system, and through entertainment, and through this hyperbole, through this extra, this ideology of the exceptional, the extraordinary. So now that uh, the male role has been diminished because the male was the one who was the provider and the protector and because the institution now has taken over this role making the male pretty much obsolete what happens is sexual relationships uh, sexual courting has become more of a feminine game uh, it's become more feminized so how do females signal their fertility to the male by their beauty, by their symmetry, their their proportionality, by certain organs in proportion to what organs, like the hip to waist ratio. This is how they signal the skin tone and so, uh, things like this. Make uh, and of course, in more times we use artificial means, you know, to make up for whatever we've uh, deficiencies we inherit, inherited. So now the the male without this uh, feminine need for him to protect and to provide how does he attract how does he stand out how does he impress well with uh, the exceptional the extraordinary the hyperbole given that even this if it doesn't exceed a certain point or if it doesn't contradict the system that offers him this protection in other words, it doesn't uh, conflict with the interests of the system itself. It could reach any proportions. It can be as uh, delusional, as extraordinary, as as totally detached from reality as it uh, can be. Its only rule is that it remain, first of all, communicable. I mean, that means that uh, the words used, the symbols used, have to have meaning to the others who he, the male is communicating his virility to. And the second, and this is where the competition happens, the construct, in this case we're talking about philosophy, the cohesive worldview has to be self-referential and cohesive. Uh, that means every abstraction in it does not contradict the other abstractions. It has to be harmonious to itself. This is where the competition is, how to construct something of beauty no matter how detached from the world it is, no matter how absurd it is, no matter how useless it is, or no matter how detrimental to survival it is, if it were to be applied in the world uh, directly and uh, honestly. It's the world, the world itself, that imposes restrictions on the organism uh, and on its thinking and subsequently on the words it uses for instance the sequence of how words are used is not arbitrary it's just it's not just decided by the organism it is imposed upon the organism if it is interested to adhere to reality by linear time that means causality so one precedes the other one phenomenon precedes the other one proceeds the other so you cannot use consciousness as preceding life when there is no evidence of this in existence you the world that is precedent your experience imposes this limit on your conceptualizing and your words your language have to reflect this otherwise you're just talking nonsense so you can't say uh, one concept precedes the other when it's never been found in 
nature. It's never been experienced in the world. Now, the only reason to do this is to escape the world. In order, uh, the only way you can survive this delusion is if you're sheltered within the world by some other entity, some other being, some perhaps an institution, some other organism. Then you can fabricate any nonsense you want, or you can believe any nonsense you want. You can put it in any sequence you want, even if you uh, then contradict yourself if you apply it, but you can believe it within your head uh, as long as you don't have to apply it. You don't have to actually live by the consequences of applying it. And this is why nihilism is only possible in modern times when the institutions, uh, human techniques and technologies have advanced to such a, an extent uh, that it it creates the shell, this sheltering. But not only this, it, it's only plausible in a world where husbandry, that is the manipulation, the control of uh, minds, of animals, of organisms, has reached such a level of uh, sophistication that it has gone beyond just the simple uh, coercion using the threat uh, and promise mechanism. Here we have the method of uh, of uh, brainwashing, of uh, manipulating emotions, of convincing the organism of what it most desperately wants to believe is so, and in this way making it a participant in its own enslavement, making it uh, a, a participant in its own brainwashing. This is the world within. Uh, which nihilism flourishes it's the only place it can flourish because if it were to apply itself uh, honestly outside of these premises it would soon perish or it would be forced to as usual lie contradict itself as nihilism always does from throughout history from christianity to marxism all based on uh, this fantastic conception of the world and of man within it, which could never survive within the world. So they had to then apply violence to impose their rules, or it had to uh, brainwash the masses, trying to impose their uh, delusions upon the masses. And this is where we can now understand the appeal to nihilism. Because, like the peacock tail, it is so impressive, so extraordinary within a world that scares, that uh, threatens, that restricts. It's, it's what the, the monads call, this is what the monads call by open-mindedness. This idea that everything is possible. Of course everything is possible once you're you're taken care of and you're not inhibited by any other uh, factor like survival like your existence everything is taken care of everything is pretty much guaranteed so then you can just release your imagination and make it as fantastic as fantasy based as possible only uh, restricting yourself to the rule and this is a uh, this is the only rule. First of all, it's the dictionary rule, which is imposed upon communication for the purpose of communication. And there's the social rule, which is you don't contradict the delusion of your neighbor so that he may uh, also humor your delusion. This is the so-called uh, golden rule, or it's called civility, or it's called respect. Pretty much it's the exclusion of self, it's a mutual understanding where both part parties exclude themselves from natural selection. In this case, not genetic selection, but mimetic selection. 